hopefully equip people with information. And I'm really excited to talk to you about what you're doing. It's interesting timing as I learned about uh, MEND and um, really what y'all are doing. Um, I was just having some conversations with a previous guest, a person who's become a friend. I was putting on some events and this idea of continuum of health rather than this like political discussion, I'll call it, of modern versus natural or what have you. And it seems like you've you've kind of uh, become the purple party in medicine. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it really is all about making sure that um, it's patient centered and holistic and um, patients, you know, come in and out of care in their entire life. Um, so it's meeting them where they're at. Yeah. So um, quick background, like, you know, what started? So I know you started Upgrade uh, and then you merged with men. So maybe give a little bit of a backstory because I really noticed, uh, you know, the bridging between natural world and mainstream medicine. So how did, what was your backstory on how that kind of came into play? Sure. Yeah. So um, I spent most of my career in t traditional healthcare industry. So I had roles like uh, global head of open innovation at GSK, um, worked at Pfizer in phase three before clinical trials. So I had seen it, like the entire infrastructure behind, you know, traditional healthcare provisioning. And um, I think that for me, the, the piece that was missing was really patient-centered, prevention-focused care. Mm -hmm. So when I first looked at, um, when I launched Upgrade with my co-founder, Justin Kamine, he actually came to me looking for a solution um, for, uh, you know, aches and soreness that wasn't uh, NSAIDs. Um, because mm -hmm. we all know there's a lot of uh, dangerous effects of taking NSAIDs on a long-term basis. And um, when we first met, I told him, well, you know, there are no botanical ingredients that can be fast acting pain relievers. It just, they just don't work that way. They have to work with your body, um, you know, and build up in your system. And, um, but we put our heads together and you know, within six months had launched our first product, which is Perform Daily Inflammation. And um, really found that there were a lot of people who were looking for a more natural solution. Mm -hmm. And um, we found that the mindset was people who were wanted to take control of their, um, their health and um, really had a moment where they realized, um, it, you know, there was an awakening that they had to do something, whether it was a wow a bad um, result at a checkup with their doctor, or if it was some genetic sensitivity where they knew that they were, you know, predisposed to become a, you know, a type two diabetic or just something like that, that put them in this point of awareness. So we really found that there was this, this consumer need. And, um, but the piece that is so important is that lifestyle so um, yeah. influences people's outcomes. So that's really where the merger with MEND was perfect because MEND was coming at it from an orthopedic side and, um, you know, looking at those acute interventions and we match that with that moment of consideration. So when people are focused on their health, um, that's the time that you can get their attention and yeah. looking at their underlying health and prevention. Um, and, and specifically for Upgrade, the platform that we have, um, since uh, the solutions that we have are really um, from our personal experiences. And um, I'm an amateur athlete. And so I've had a lot of injuries and some surgeries. And um, yeah. like, even though I've had amazing doctors uh, and the procedures went really well, it feels like after that, you're on your own. And, yeah. um, you know, because I have a healthcare background, it's okay because when I got handed the packet of information, uh, I knew that I digest it later, but, you know, I can imagine people who don't like you come out of anesthesia and you're groggy and you're not sure like what your next instructions are. Um, and without that discipline, there's a huge gap in, and yeah. it could lead to less than optimal outcomes. Um, so, so that's really like, what was the idea behind upgrade by mend? And that's where we combine clinical nutrition with doctor recommended care plans. And they're administered by live nurses and dietitians. So before and after surgery, like everyone can have our team uh, to help optimize outcomes uh, and recovery. So there is like, I'll call it a health coaching. That terminology is getting pretty broad use, but like uh, somebody that facilitate, because to your point, you know, you happen to be probably an anomaly uh, in the sense of, you know, being equipped to do it on your own relatively well, but you still need support. 
where most people, I think, and this isn't a knock on anyone, it's just you need that support because you only know what you know. For sure. Absolutely. And, and that's where our care team um, is. It's really designed to be human first. Like there's a lot of digital health solutions that are um, their auto messages, their bots. Um, you know, they're the kind of things where it doesn't have that personal touch. So mm-hmm. what we do is we specifically have, you know, the patient onboarded with um, an RN and uh, a registered dietitian and our dietitian sessions are actually uh, video conferencing. So we really understand the patient's needs and create um, a nutrition plan for them that is um, in support of both the surgery and also whatever underlying chronic conditions they have. Like we keep that in mind as we tailor their program. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about this from a, you, um, similar to yourself, I guess, an amateur athlete, do endurance stuff. Um, but the, the area in athletics is the prehab that gets avoided mm. so often. And it sounds like based on what I was reading, y'all do that also from a surgery perspective, there's, there's an important ingredient on the prehab piece and using some of the, um, uh, solutions that MEND has. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. It, it's so important. And in fact, many people don't even realize they're undernourished because they don't look malnourished, um, but they may not have the key nutritional components that are going to allow them to prevent muscle atrophy and get through surgery in a good way. And when you think about what happens to you in surgery, it, it's it's like, like like having a car accident, like yeah. your, your body's cut up and, you know, all these things traumatic event. Yeah, it's traumatic. Um, So you want to put your body in the best state going into it. And, you know, one of the things that we found is that a a huge percentage of people are low in albumin. Um, And that's why, you know, our products have essential amino acids, um, along with other ingredients that are going to help speed recovery. And, you know, as I said, reduce muscle atrophy, increase range Mm -hmm. of motion, all those things that you're looking for after surgery. Can you expand on that a little bit? The importance you mentioned Albion. Uh, I think I just hacked that up, but uh, that's okay. Albumin. <laughs> yeah. Um, how important, what that is and, and the, the whys around the aminos. Yeah, sure. So um, there, there is, there's a lot of chains in healing and um, you, you know, basically it's making sure that um, your body's resistant to infection, um, as well as inflammation, and um, the right balance of, of amino acids, like ensure that you're set up for a success. Okay. So how do you, is it personalized when it comes to what they take? Or is it like, I'm going in for surgery, take this, or is there maybe some other variations involved? Or how do you assess that? Maybe that's a better question. Sure. Yeah. So, so our program actually has a couple of different components. Some of them are standardized that ever, like everyone will go through the same care pathway for uh, like, for example, our first indication is joint replacement. Mm -hmm. So for joint replacement, we've worked with doctors to understand, um, you know, what their regimen is. And what we've done is looking at the recovery process, which they've outlined much more clearly, we've looked at the the what you're calling the prehab. Like so, before um, we know that a minimum of a week before we want the patients to have those essential amino acids. But what we found is that if we can get the patient even sooner, we can make sure that um, you know we're maintaining even those um, those uh, lifestyle influenceable chronic factors. Um, like blood sugar and, mm-hmm. um, you know, like making sure their their heart uh, um, rate is in the right range. And that's what we do with our nurses. Um, but basically the nutrition piece has the men functional nutrition products, and that's the same for everyone. So we start, uh, you know, essentially two months before surgery with repair and recover. Okay. And then one week before they start on the joint replacement product. But in parallel, that's where our registered dietitian is working with the patient to see, you know, what is the rest of their life look like so that because every program has to fit into someone's lifestyle. And sometimes nutritionists get um, into this like bad cop mode where it's like you can (laughs) never have a cookie or, you know, things like that. And that's just not realistic. You know, so our our philosophy with food is, you know, again, to meet a patient where they are and our dietitian 
clinicians work with the patient to understand their motivation. So mm. like, what's their motivation for change and how can we get them to adopt these healthy habits like one step at a time? So even though there's a foundation of like, if someone has cardiovascular concerns, it's going to be loosely structured around the DASH diet, or they'll be more focused towards reducing your sodium intake. Okay. But it isn't like a strict diet. It's really, mm -hmm. you know, a, a personal connection with the dietitian that is is essentially coaching somebody to improve their skills so that once they leave the program, they have healthy eating habits for the rest of their life. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it sounds more like modifications than like a wholesale so, you know, diet has become such a negative terminology as if it's like a short term thing or really that's what you ought to be doing from a lifestyle perspective. Absolutely. Um, it, you know, it, that's really, a, I think, an important ingredient is that equipping piece of people. And I like where you said meeting people where they are, um, because it, I think we all have that child in us where. We, like you said, the, the RN or the nutritionist, kind of the finger wagging, don't do it. Like we all kind of turn into that teenager again and <laughs> end up not wanting to do it or defy it, right? Um, for sure. But and it's also having a substitute for that, right? So if you're feeling that way, if you want to reach for like stress eating, what can you do instead? Mm -hmm. Um, is another way. And, you know, because part of that lifestyle, it's not just diet, it's sleep, it's stress. Um, so all of those factors influence yeah. like the, people's eating patterns. And we address that too in the sessions. Yeah, that's a great on the personalization because like w on the stress piece, like what everybody reaches for something different. I tend to reach for sweets. Somebody else might reach for like sweet and salty or something, but um, it, it's an important personalization element. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's understanding those triggers um, because the more aware that you can be of like, what's a situation that's going to get you to the point where you have that vulnerability and uh, avoiding those. And if you can't like having something else, that's a go-to, um, yeah. you know, and there's, there's a, a whole bunch of education that's built into our program. So when patients are, we, we have them for six months, basically in the total joint replacement program. And we have over a hundred instructional videos that we can offer up to the patients um, oh, wow. So we're pretty much coaching and education for any purpose. So like one is the benefits of exercise. So like we send people like a, a short, you know, really digestible, um, no pun intended um, video. That's like why you should exercise. Here's all the benefits. And, you know, sometimes it's one of those things where, and because we're delivering things by text message, it, you know, if someone's in the moment of being stressed out, we can just send them an intervention, which is very helpful. Oh, wow. That's pretty amazing. So it's not just the nutrition piece, it is the mindset element to to working with individuals. Absolutely. And you know, it's it's multimodal care because yeah. the patient is is all of these aspects. And that's why we uh, specifically built our platform so we can deliver many different types of interventions. So I mentioned jokingly at the beginning, kind of splitting the uprights between the politicizing of medicine that seems to be so pervasive, if not getting bigger, what, um, what made you come up with, I guess, this therapeutic supplements, right? It's kind of not pharmaceutical sort of, but it's not full-blown supplements. What were, what were the reasons behind that? Sure. And, and this is really personal to me because, um, you know, having been in like prescription pharma, but I was also um, VP of R&D at Nature's Bounty. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the there really needs to be a category in between supplements and um, prescription drugs. And the mindset is that if you could use like some of the same uh, like thought process as over-the-counter drugs use to make sure that they're more um, efficacious, mm -hmm. then you could have this like elevated level of compliance um, because su supplements basically are, and many people think they're not FDA regulated. Of course they are. They're, they just don't require pre-market approval. Mm -hmm. um, and they, as you know, the Deshaies regulations prohibit supplements from um, you know, treating, diagnosing, or curing any disease or condition. So right. because of that, everything has to be designed for basically a well patient so that you're keeping them in that state of wellness. So, but there doesn't 
there isn't a lot of evidence required because the risk is low. So the main focus around supplements is that they're safe. And when you get more into uh, OTC and prescription drug categories, you have to prove that it's both safe and effective. Okay. So in in that in the roles that I had, I said, well, why couldn't supplements show more evidence of their efficaciousness? And there are some really great brands out there that do this to differing levels, but um, many of them are not as focused on the functional need states that w we've been looking at. And it starts with making sure that um, your ingredients are standardized because that that's a huge problem with with some supplements is that if they're not standardized and and the potency varies from if it's especially if it's a botanical extract and there's seasonal variation yeah. um and you don't account for that like one week it could work uh you know and the, the next lot that you make it might not work so um so we only work with standardized extracts and um ones that are clinically demonstrated at a particular dose so okay. we we make sure that we formulate at the efficacious dose um, and also that the, the, com the components are bioavailable. Okay. So like many natural components are um, not well absorbed by the body. Um, so the ones that we work with uh, use pharmaceutical methods to make sure that they are. So okay. like one method is, is called a pharmacokinetic study. And that's where you actually, you, you run a controlled trial where you give per, people a product and there's actually blood draws taken to show that the concentration of the product is literally present in your blood. Um, and this is done routinely for, you know, drug product development, um, but not so often in supplements because, um, you know, the requirement isn't there. Yeah. So, but, but these are the standards that we hold ourselves to at MEND because we want to, we know that our products work and, um, because I take them myself, that's uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, that's one of the reasons why they do. Yeah, no, I think that's that's huge. I mean, it's in line with another conversation I had within the last month or so of you know, there's a lot of value in supplementation, but comes with some negative stigma of you know snake oil, and then you have the similar on the on the pharmaceutical side of things, or you know whatever negative connotation you want to put around them, like a lot of the you know, the joke on the commercials with the side effects, right. And, and right. the laundry list of things that could happen and, and somewhere in there, there has to be that middle ground and, and even to compliment, you know, if a pharmaceutical is depleting a vitamin B, why not work with a supplement to offset that rather than, and, Absolutely. And it seems like there's an incomplete conversation for whatever reason. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And and also, you know, just to be clear, um, uh, pharmaceutical products have their place. They save lives. Absolutely. And necessary. And, yeah. you know, for me, like, like that's where there is no like us or them, you know, right. it's, it's really that, you know, depending on upon a patient's needs, it's also what is their risk profile? You know, mm -hmm. so so some of those things that are risks, they have to be mentioned by law. But when you start to look at, you know, what are the percentage of people who have these problems or, you know, do I have specific risk factors that mean I shouldn't take this medication? And that's something that only everyone has to assess with their doctor on their own. That's a great, great point and a new favorite word nuance, right? And is, is really understanding your risk profile. Absolutely. There's a lot of good things. I mean, heck, even foods like a tomato may be considered healthy for you, but maybe not for certain people who have maybe certain sensitivities or, you know, whatever, fill in the blank with whatever thing that's supposedly good. Um, yep. You know, prime example for me personally, is, or at least my daughter is peanut. Peanut's considered one of the best proteins to consume, but it's, uh, she has a peanut allergy, so uh, it could potentially kill her. So you yeah. have this diametrically opposed truths that exist and it, it that turns into that personalization and understanding your own self for sure and even poison is in the dosage <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's you know um I, I like that but i think that's the empowering piece that y'all seem to work with as well as really helping the individual understand themselves better um through the process starting early and then working with them yeah. And, you know, it, I hope that at some point there is an ability to get closer to personalized nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
with um, a lot of genetic testing, there, there's some promise that you can see like like tendencies and susceptibilities, but it, it's nowhere near being able to have like that blueprint. It's really more your experience and you know, eliminate process of elimination and understanding what works for you and really being aware of your body and your symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. That awareness factor is, is really big and being able to correlate how you feel. Cause I think for me, before I really started to use the word awaken, um, you would just, I would just blow it off. Oh yeah. yeah I feel bloated now, or I feel what I'm feeling like again. Um, but that awareness of seeing the correlation to something I ate or did, um, and it has an impact on your body. Absolutely. So where do you, um, well, if I can pull on the, the splitting the uprights thing again, the political, political aspects of it, what are, what's an, an area of opportunity to kind of change that or how do we go about that? Well, you're, you're penny and a half on that. Well, I think that. Um, there's a lot of complexity to the healthcare system in the U.S., right? And and I think that is at the root of a lot of the problems because um, the the fact that there's different categories of products means that we all have to operate under different rules, and this mm-hmm. makes it really confusing to consumers. So like, and in fact, even, you know, many of the years that I was in product development in OTC medications, like we would even say, well, that's Rx, that's OTC, this is a supplement, but the consumer doesn't see those Mm -hmm. differences. So I think that just coming together with a more common sense language that's understandable for patients is important. And, um, you know, there's various organizations like industry groups, um, but I, I feel like there's um has to be centered around certain initiatives so like there's some great initiatives for different diseases and i think that's where you get more um like multifunctional collaboration and and um people who are from different areas and i think that's when the innovation really happens okay yeah that i I think that's a that's a great point um where do you see this going uh do you see that like progress do you think we're in an environment now coming out of the the last few years it seems like there's a there's kind of some shaking when it comes to health and people viewing it a little differently do you think there's a real opportunity for a company like men to to kind of help split the uprights for that oh i sure do and in fact um one of the things i'm really excited about is um, that the pandemic has opened up a huge amount of opportunity. Mm-hmm. And whenever I, I always say, don't never waste a good crisis. Um, and because we had the ability to see, you know, vaccines developed on, on a timeline that was n- unheard of. Like it was never contemplated that something could happen that fast. Um, but on the more personal level, a lot of the emergency use authorization for telemedicine has opened up remote patient monitoring, um, the ability mm-hmm. to like bring care to patients in their home. The, and this is just, it, it's amazing for two reasons. Um, it reduces cost, obviously, and it allows the care to be triaged so that people it can, um, the, only the people who need to go to the emergency room in the hospitals can go there, right? So other, it, it just manages costs in the healthcare system overall in a great way. But the next way is that it improves outcomes. Like with these asynchronous views of what patients are doing, like in between their visits, it gives, you know, doctors and, and, you know, healthcare companies like us, the ability to see what's happening in between there, like yeah. all of these lifestyle aspects, um, they get in the way of us understanding what really works because they're uncontrolled variables. Um, you know, so it's like when you look at, I come from the world of like clinical trials that, you know, are very controlled and, you know, everything is prescribed in, in a certain way. You get a lot of data and information from that, but the stuff goes out in the real world and it totally different things happen, you yeah. know, it's. So, so like when we have all these things that allow us to monitor it, like that, that can lead to huge breakthroughs. And I think that's where, you know, there, there is no politicization of it. Like if you, if you can come up with something that can fix the care model, because it gives like lower cost of care, better outcomes, who wouldn't want that? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great, 
great point and, and an important message to it, it really is about outcomes at the end of the day and and there's many ways to approach that uh in part because there's many ways that are successful but it also depends on the client and that marrying that up with the recipient and i guess the uh, the method for sure yeah so, in um, fact go ahead. oh no you go <laughs> no, go ahead no you go go yeah you it's your microphone. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say that, um, you know, one of the other things that MEND is doing to help is that um, the often a lot of the high tech things um, go to a very small uh, percentage of the population and it's the people who can afford them and yeah. um, not always the ones who need the care the most. Um, so the fact that we started with total joint replacement, that's a population that's generally older, um, really needs the support. And um, we were able to design our, our system in a way that um, it, people who aren't tech savvy can use it mm -hmm. and that we have a wide range of business models. So, so from the people who can afford private pay to like working with our hospital clients to figure out how to bundle it into the cost of care of their surgery. Okay. So like that's another way to have change happen is to increase access to care. Um, because, and, and even using digital methods to try and, um, like digitize that expertise, that's mm -hmm. going to democratize people's access to the best care. Well, and it sounds like it would also improve the touch points because in, in compliance, um, and even just understanding like, what you were kind of implying before is like, you, you see them in January and August and no idea what happens in between to determine why August looks like it does. Absolutely. And, and in fact, in pharma, one of the key hurdles is compliance, even just with taking medication. So, and, and that is one area where you can send automated reminders, um, mm -hmm. which is very helpful, but yeah. then it's also probing the resistance. So like there's many, many people who are resi resistant to taking statins and, you know, some of them have legitimate reasons because of side effects and others don't. So then it's like understanding that patient. It's like, they're not taking their meds, but why, why aren't they taking their meds? Like, that's the next question that doesn't often get asked. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding the why is a, is a big one. So where do you see men evolving? You mentioned um, it's focused on elder care and surgery. Um do you see it applicable to other demographics? And um, if so, how? Sure, absolutely. And, you know, we we started with that population for total joint replacement um, because we had such a great patient journey. And we also, you know, truth be told, obviously, we did look at that smartphone is as a, as a requirement mm -hmm. and adoption is actually pretty high, even in that group. Like you wouldn't think, but um, for 50 to 64 year olds, 61, 83% uh, of people in that range have smartphones and it's 61% for over 65. Okay. So like, like we still have the requirement for, um, you know, having a, a, the technology to support it. Um, but the fact that we're able to design a system for even non-tech savvy people to use means that it's going to be easier for us for those other indications. So yeah. like we chose this use case because we're like, well, you know, if this population adopts it, then we know like it, it, it's a good test case that for the general population, it's going to be easier. Um, and the the platform um, can go into other adjacencies. So one one that we're looking at next is um, surgical oncology, okay. um, because there's a lot of similarities in uh, like the whole surgical portion of it. But again, looking at oncology patients with their very different needs for for diet and um, you know like support is if they're post chemotherapy. Like so, there's a lot of different areas that. Um, we are, we've designed the platform, not just to be a point solution so that like we can look at other indications and expand into those. Okay, great. You mentioned cancer. So is that, so that's an area of support that you're looking at cancer care or? So, you know, everything that we do be, for our products, um, remains in the, um, nutrition support, you know, mm -hmm. not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure sure. any disease or condition. So for the support that we're providing, it's um, our nurses 
actually helping to coach patients through a patient journey. So, and the, like the one specifically, if it were surgical oncology, it would be like, is this planned surgery and what kind, how can we make sure that especially chemotherapy patients that have trouble keeping their food down? Like, can we design a nutrition plan for you to make sure that when you go into surgery, you're prepared and you're going to have the best outcomes? So like, that's the kind of thing that's translatable from what yeah. we're learning now with the total joint replacement. That makes sense. And it just makes sense too, if you're building up nutrients before they go into some of the things they're doing, the stronger you are walking into those types of medical interventions would, would make sense. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. Um, well, I, what, what, what is a key area that you're focused on next um, beyond you know, the oncology is that, do you see where, do you have a long-term roadmap on, I mean, everybody or. Athlete? So sure. Yeah. So, so basically the idea is where can we be most effective to combine nutritional solutions with uh, care? Mm -hmm. So it, it's really marrying our portfolio of um, clinically proven functional nutrition with a care need that engages a patient for a certain period of time, because we, we have to have the patient and for enough time to prove the outcome. Yeah. So like, like, and in fact, one of the areas we looked at right away was, was trauma. And it, it, it depends on what kind of trauma. So if, if you're literally in a car accident and you get, uh, you know, brought to the ER, like we don't have time to help the patient. Like it's, it's happening right then and there. Right. <laughs> So like what we're doing in our roadmap is we're matching, um, you know, these types of things where a patient is under care, where they need support and where nutrition can benefit them. And that's how, how we've defined, uh, defined our roadmap. Okay, great. So you, you kind of alluded to this, I think, but so is this a direct to consumer? Do you work with hospitals directly, um, you know, covered by healthcare, things of that nature? Yeah, so uh, the prime, the majority of our business model is B two B with mm -hmm. hospitals. So even before the upgrade um, platform, the Mend products have been sold um, and on formulary at hospitals in, in major health systems and used by major orthopedic surgeons around the country. So um, that is really where the um, the clinical data had has was so important because the clinicians were really convinced by the data that this was something that would help their patients. So um, adding on the upgrade platform was to wrap those products in that multimodal support. Okay. So so that's that's our primary business model. Um, but you know, as you mentioned, since uh, the the upgrade company came together with Mend, up, upgrade company was initially direct to consumer for. Um, some of the products. So we still offer our products direct to consumer. Um, and we are working on uh, a direct to consumer support package. Um, so so actually, we're we're just putting together a nutrition only program, even for people who are getting joint replacement surgery, um, that it, it is with a partner that we have not yet worked with. Okay. So a person can basically have the regimen of products and the nutrition counseling. They just would not have the support of our RNs. They would have the RD and the products, but um, and without the connection with the hospital, we can't engage the um, the medical piece. Gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome. That's really encouraging. I think it, it's fascinating. I like, I really love what the company is about in that, you know, you, the natural world and, and the main mainstream medicine, um, is such a, such a huge opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the last few years have proven that people are waking up and at least becoming aware of options that brought span the spectrum of health. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I like to end things, uh, on a couple of questions, personal, nothing major, uh, hot seat, but what, uh, are you reading right now? Huh, that's that's a good one. Um because I, I just finished reading um uh burn rates to starting a startup and losing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, bonobos. Um, but that was um 
just like uh, it's somebody recommended it to me. It's not like a uh, a, a commentary on my state of mind. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, that's a good. I'll have to check that one out. Um, okay, what are you listening to right now? Be it music or podcast. So I um, I have extensive uh, Spotify playlists because I'm currently training for a um, a sprint triathlon. Oh, so cool. I, I have like my different sports have different playlists. So like there's the high energy ones for like, you know, when I'm sprinting and, you know, then there's the chill ones for when I calm down. So it's, it's all over the map. I have a very eclectic musical taste. Awesome. <laughs> So uh, you're doing a sprint. That's great. So uh, is it open water or is it pool swim? It, it's open water. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this one actually is in Florida, which I'm going to travel to. So I haven't really traveled to a race before. It'll be the first time for me. Cool. That's fun. Uh, what is your go to rest and recovery method? So really massages. Like, I, I think that is, it's not just a luxury. I feel like particularly if you're training that um, it, it's just such an amazing way to get the, the toxins out of, out of your body and, you know, release that lactic acid. And, and in fact, um, a couple of years back, I, I went through a full rolfing, which, which is quite an experience. It just like, you know, releases your fascia and like yeah. it improves your alignment. So I, I don't, I don't do that regularly, but I think feel like the massages are like a mini touch up along the way. That's awesome. I've never done that, the, the, the rolfing before, but so how was that? It's, it's really painful. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so worth it. It's, it's like, and it's, I think it's like 10 sessions that you have to go and each one focuses on a different body area. So like, there's no relief. It's just like so much like, and it's like, please move on. It's like, nope, we're doing your leg. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and it really, honestly, I, we didn't take measurements, but I felt taller and it's just the freedom of m motion after it. Yeah. It's, it's palpable. Awesome. I'll go check that one out. Um, well, I, I thank you so much for your time, insights, and really appreciate what you and Mend are doing and uh, look forward to seeing where, where it goes. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on.